Good morning, everybody. There's still a few people joining from the waiting room, so I'll just give people a couple more seconds before we formally start this morning's Muscle Matters session. Great, so I think we'll, we'll kick off. Predi predictably, some work has just started in the street outside me, so apologies if you hear any background noise um, as I'm speaking. Um, I'm Rob Burley. I'm MV UK's Director of Campaigns, Care and Support, and it's my pleasure to be um, chairing this morning's Muscle Matters session on mitochondrial disease, which is taking place, of course, during Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Week. So building on the success of our 2020 series, and having taken your feedback into account, the Muscle Matters seminars have become a regular feature in MDUK's calendar. They hopefully won't replace um, physical events, which were um, I, I have a vague memory of pre-COVID, um, but they'll certainly run alongside them um, as we go, to the, go into the future because they've proved to be a popular way of connecting with people. Um, we're running two or three seminars a month and they are focusing on a range of general and condition specific topics and then include sessions that you've told us you found the most valuable. Um, a note that our helpline remains available to anyone affected by muscle wasting conditions, so do please contact us if you have any questions or are in need of support. We can help with information and can either support you directly or signpost you to any support you might need. Um, you can contact us via 0800 652 6352 or you can email us at info at musculodystrophyuk.org. We're really grateful to be joined by an expert panel this morning covering a broad range of expertise on mitochondrial disease. And we're also very grateful for the support of our sponsors this morning, PTC Therapeutics and Roche. We're splitting the session into two parts and we'll begin by looking at research and then we'll move on to exploring living with and managing the condition. So before we begin, a quick note on how you can ask questions or make comments throughout the session. Um, we have some advanced questions and we'll seek to cover these as the seminar progresses. But we'd also like to incorporate some live input and to do this we'll be using the Q&A function. So please type your question or comment and you should be able to see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll feed comments into the discussion. To help us manage the technical side of the event we won't be calling on people to ask their questions live and any questions we don't manage to cover or don't know the answers to and um, we'll seek to answer through our website or get back to you directly after the session. Um, we are recording the session and it will be made available over the next few days. So to start us off, I'm delighted to hand over to my colleague, Dr. John Copier, who will introduce our research speaker and then chair that part of this morning's discussion. So, John, over to you. Thank you, Rob, and good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Professor Grania Gorman has many hats, both clinical and research. She's the director of the medical uh, of the Wellcome Center for Mitochondrial Research at the Newcastle University, um, an internationally renowned center of excellence for mitochondrial disease. She's also the neuromuscular theme lead within the NIHR Newcastle Biomedical Research Center and a senior clinical lecturer in the Institute of Translational and Clinical Research at Newcastle University. Clinically, she's a consultant neurologist at the Neurosciences Centre of the Newcastle Royal Victoria Infirmary, with a particular interest in neuromuscular diseases. Professor Gorman qualified from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland in 1997. After completing three years of general medical training in Dublin, she moved to Newcastle to further her interests in neuromuscular diseases. Professor Gorman has a very comprehensive talk this morning covering new techniques for diagnosis, clinical trial design and drug discovery. Um, just a quick reminder to those of you joining us to use the Q&A function to submit questions and comments and we'll cover any research related questions after we've heard the talk. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Gorman for her talk. Good morning and uh, thank you John for the kind introduction. So what I'm going to do this morning is just give you a brief overview of um, some of the work we're doing, not just here in Newcastle, but leading um, throughout the UK, uh, looking at not just mitochondrial function genetics, but also possible uh, treatments and clinical trials that you may be have heard of or may be able to avail of. So first slide, please, Kat. So what are mitochondria? Well, mitochondria are effectively the powerhouses of all cells. They take the energy that we get from sugars and fats, the food that we eat, and convert it into essential energy within cells. 
And if you think about it, every cell in the body requires energy, but some cells need more. So big organs like your brain, your heart and your muscle. Next slide, Kat, please. What's unique about mitochondria is that they also contain their own little bag of, new, of genetic material. So we quite often talk about chromosomes and our nuclear material, but mitochondria also contain genetic material. And it's because of this genetic material that sometimes there's little mistakes, what we would refer to spelling mistakes within that little genetic material that can lead to neurological problems and disorders, what we would term mitochondrial diseases. Next slide, please. Interestingly, mitochondrial diseases are the most common group of inherited metabolic disorders and the most common forms of inherited neurological disorders. We've estimated about one in 4,300 people throughout the whole of the United Kingdom are affected by mitochondrial disorders, and possibly one in 200 babies are at risk of developing a serious form of mitochondrial disease. So whilst quite often these are referred to rare diseases, they're not so rare and perhaps not as, so as uncommon as previously thought. New slide, please. So as I was saying to you, the mitochondria effectively are in all cells of the body. And if we think about it, those that need the most energy, like the brain, the heart and muscle, uh, are likely to be affected when there's this misspelling mistake in that genetic material. So it's not uncommon for patients with mitochondrial disease to have symptoms such as epilepsy, issues with their balance, ataxia, uh, migraine, uh, but also more serious conditions like dementia, um, as well as a progressive early onset dementia, as well as really severe strokes and seizures, um, which can be quite debilitating. Some patients present with really severe myopathy and perhaps one of the most common symptoms. And if we think about it, it's not surprising that fatigue or severe energy depletion is a marked symptom in mitochondrial disease because patients just can't generate enough energy. Myopathy or exercise intolerance can affect you in everyday life. It can be difficulty walking up a flight of stairs. It may be that if you go for a run, you're just not able to do that. And for some of our patients, it can be really excessive that in minimal exertion, you can almost vomit or collapse after some exercise. But other organs may, can be affected that we perhaps don't think as much about. So our eyes, you know, as I'm talking to you as well today, um, my eyes are scanning across the slides as yours may as well. And we just don't think as we blink, that requires a lot of energy. The nerve behind our eyes, the optic nerve also requires a lot of energy because it's changing as light changes. And again, it can be affected with inherited visual loss. So things like optic atrophy or labors, which some of you may well have heard of. The other thing that we don't think is your gut. Your gut requires an extensive amount of energy, taking in food, digesting food, pushing all the good nutrients out, taking out the good bits and pushing out waste products. So on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of our patients have a lot of symptoms that perhaps go unseen, like severe constipation or the other extreme where it can be diarrhea and flowing through, which can be quite debilitating um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So mitochondrial disease can affect effectively any organ in the body with a range of variability, and that's what quite often can make it difficult to diagnose. Here in Newcastle, we have a long-standing history of excellence in genetic diagnosis. So it's something we have um, led the way in internationally. So making a genetic diagnosis is important, not just for the patient, for knowing what they have, but also potential future therapies and choices around things like reproduction. Other aspects that we look at here is also about setting care standards. And later today, um, or this morning, Sarah Holmes will be chatting. We work through three specialised centres here in the UK, Oxford, London and Newcastle. And we set the care standards for the United Kingdom under that umbrella of care. But we also push the boundaries both in Europe and lead the way also with our American colleagues. So we devise standards of care that have been adopted internationally. New slide, please. 
So why is it important what we do? So when you come to our clinic, be it in London, in Oxford, in Newcastle, we spend a lot of time listening to patients. It's not just about the diagnosis. At the minute, we don't have effective cures, but we're working hard to find those. But why is it important to get a genetic diagnosis? Well, not least because of what we can translate into clinical care. And perhaps one of the biggest breakthroughs in knowing your genetic diagnosis is to inform women's choices around reproduction. And perhaps the biggest breakthrough that most of you may well be aware, um, aware of is around mitochondrial donation. And that's where we try and eradicate the disease from the next generation. But there are other ways of doing that too. And now in the United Kingdom, we're the world's first to have a regulated framework for looking at reproductive options, including mitochondrial donation. New slide, please. But it's not just those things that are really important. Behind the scenes, a lot of research is currently going on in mitochondrial disease. And as John kindly was introduced to me, I was thinking, you know, I'm now 13 years in the mitochondrial field. And when I first come here, there was no therapies, there were no trials, and very few technologies or funding actually targeting mitochondrial disease. And which is really lovely to see now is that technologies and upscaling of those are really, particularly in the last five years, have made it significant advances. So I thought I'd show you this one, which is a piece of equipment that um, maybe some of you in line don't realize how much you're revolutionizing science. So patients who have kindly come and had muscle biopsies for a diagnosis, also kindly throughout the UK, allow us to keep a little bit of the tissue for research. And why has that been actually vitally important? Because now what we're trying to do is teach the machine to read that biopsy and to upscale. And what that allows us to do is make diagnosis quicker. It also allows us to get a better understanding at an absolute small cell level is when mitochondria don't work. What does that mean? And this machine literally takes little slices of muscle and allows us almost to reproduce your muscle again. And therefore, what we can do is look at how muscles communicate to each other, how little fibers communicate, how the mitochondria themselves communicate within a muscle. And this is really leading the way as we're trying to look for what we call biomarkers. That's little things that we could use to help us determine or predict how you might respond to the treatment or how the disease might progress. This picture I'm showing you is some work within our center, which, as I say, over the last five years, we have devised and developed here in the center. And it's been using tissue that patients have kindly donated um, during the uh, research process. Next slide, please. But it's not just upscaling technologies. What we're also doing is really pushing the diagnostic boundaries. So I'm sure a lot of you who have had a muscle diagnosis or muscle disease diagnosis will have had the old fashioned conventional muscle biopsy. And it still has its use, but as you can imagine, it's an invasive procedure. It requires a lot of skill to be able to do it properly. You know, I don't underestimate it's painful um, and all the other complications that might come when you're actually going in to take out a piece of muscle. We're devising better ways of doing that. So for anyone who may have had a biopsy 10 years ago, it was either you had to go to theater as an adult or you would have had to have this little machine that was actually suction applied to the wall. We don't do that anymore. We've got really neat ways of doing it. And even beyond that, we're now trying to use different tissues. So some of you may know we use blood, but can't always be reliable. We use urine. But currently over the next 18 to 24 months, we're really gonna push the boundaries and we're gonna use stool to see, can we extract from your stool? Um, so a sample, so it's non-invasive. It means we could take the, the little genetic bag of mitochondria and make a genetic diagnosis. And we not only want to make the genetic diagnosis for those patients who we look at the level of faulty mitochondria described of heteroplasmy, we're also pushing the boundaries to do that as well. And why would that be important? Because it's less invasive. It has a implications for diagnosis, particularly in children where they have to be put asleep for a biopsy, but also 
you know, working around the pandemic where perhaps people can't get into clinical practice, these samples could be collected at home and posted. The next thing we're also doing is using facial recognition to see if we can predict what form of mitochondrial disease you can have. And we're using artificial intelligence and again, pushing the boundaries for diagnostic techniques. And what's really lovely, that's an international collaboration right across the globe um, to try and perfect that technique. And again, why are we doing it? Because if you walk into clinic, we could, you know, we may have three specialized centers at the minute, but what we want to do is that when you go to a local service, that we can speed up diagnosis for you as best we can. Next slide, please. We're also looking at different ways of applying new techniques to look at tissues we have. And again, this is very much around the generosity of patients who have kindly donated um, their bodies, including their brains for um, scientific research. What we've done in the past is where, you know, there was uh, quite conventional ways of looking tissues. Now we don't actually need to rely on that. If you look at the little picture in the corner of the green brain and the purple brain, um, we're now actually able to scan and reconstruct your brain using MRI. And that in a way is giving us valuable information about the areas of the brain that have been damaged by episodes of stroke or seizures in patients with mitochondrial disease that are predisposed to those. So there's a real push in science to one work out is what is causing these events whilst we know they are seizure mediated, unless we fully understand what drives these events, we are going to find it exceptionally difficult to find effective treatment and cure. We know that stroke-like episodes conventionally were considered stroke in the past. That is not the case. These are actually seizures that mimic stroke on the scan. What we're trying to do here is, is actually at a very small level, work out what's going wrong so we can get more effective treatment. At the minute, we just reuse treatments that are conventionally used. What we're trying to do is make specific treatment that can stop the event and ideally prevent it ever happening in the first in the first instance. Next slide. Thank you. But perhaps where the whole holy grail is leading to is around effective cures and treatments. And we really do, you know, push towards effective treatments and cures. Um, with specifically here in the UK, we work across all three centres. So London, Oxford and ourselves are really leading in clinical trial delivery for patients with mitochondrial disease. But the truth is we can't do this without patients. When we design the trial, so we have a study that actually was designed with patients, um, it only but enhances the quality of the study. We have worked with our European partners um, on a thing called Prefer, looking at patient preferences to when patients' voice should be heard along the drug discovery pathway. And I'm sure it's no surprise to you, it should be every step of the pathway and right from the outset. And the truth is, as I'm sure many of you are, that's not often where patients are asked to step in. Someone's already way down the regulatory process before they're actually asked. So what's really nice is we're bringing patients, regulatory authorities, uh, funding bodies and industry partners together to try and better devise not just the kind of drugs we may look at, but how we actually design clinical trials. And you know, one thing I always say, you may have the best treatment or compound, but if you don't know how to measure it in a clinical trial, it's never gonna work. Just as the same as you may have a drug or treatment that's not very good either. So here in Newcastle, we're doing an awful lot on drug discovery. We're pushing the boundaries, working with our industrial partners, looking at small compounds, and also looking at drugs that perhaps were used for some else which is called repurposing and seeing would they be any good for patients with mitochondrial disease as you can imagine you know again if five or six years ago that was very much in its infancy we're pushing and leading the way particularly in the drug discovery um, and trying to partner with industry we previously had done a survey with some of our patients as to asking you know what are your thoughts around our collaborations with industry or do i also say using animal models to, to devise new drugs, because we know that both those areas can be quite controversial. Um, the cost involved in taking a drug, which is a compound right through to discovery is phenomenal. 
And unless we partner with industry, we're never going to get there in a timely manner. But what I also would say they have a lot to learn from us and patients is because, you know, the amount, you know, the new partnerships we're devising um, works really nicely. And as a, a, in particular between myself and um, Dr. Rob Keithley in London, where we had a lot of the clinical trials around mitochondrial disease, actually we have patients involved in every step of the process, even when the industry partners approaches us in the first instance. So uh, currently there's five active clinical trials, which is significant um, for our field, perhaps not relative to others, but it is for ours when you think there was effectively nothing in 2015. Um, and there's at least another three studies in setup. So the future looks really bright. We have more to do, but um, it's really nice to see that uh, there is a, a, a real push internationally towards not just discovering the drug, but getting better clinical trial design. And I'm sure Sarah will actually um, touch on some of these aspects because measuring, you know, measuring what you think you're measuring what you actually measure quite often can be two different things and for a drug we have to prove it works so regulators are quite strict about what that might look like but in other aspects we must we need to get that right so again working with everybody else um, it is really really important that we get it right um, someone's just asked about alternative therapies in this. Um, there are uh, aspects of alternative therapies, and I suppose that, you know um, we would in corporate alternative therapies. I suppose is what would that be defined as? But you know there are things um, um, that you know around particularly headache management or um, also gut management that are potentially looked at. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone individually around that because we have used some of those, particularly around gut management um, that are alternative to the conventional drug therapies. And they absolutely have a place to play. Uh, I am really strict, but as well that they undergo the same rigorous evaluation as a compounder drug group. But yes, there are um, emerging alternative therapies in this field. Next slide, please. So drug discovery, you can imagine. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd just give you a little flavor of some of the things we're trying to look at. So I think when people think around drug discovery, um, you know, we are starting right back at the start, looking at what the compound will actually we partner with industry and we actually ask they have a library of compounds they've screened and working with them, we can actually take them a look and see, oh, are they any good to us? So it's natural products as well as small molecules and we screen and see if they have an efficacy or potential role in what we know is dysfunctional mitochondria we have screened at least in our center hundreds of thousands of compounds currently we've got a couple of um, compounds that look extremely exciting and this um, may be of benefit the difficulty is as you can see this is a long process even just for this slide alone sometimes can be 10 years and then you've a regulatory framework which can double that time as well that's why looking at compounds the purpose so drugs used for something else can speed that process because it eliminates that but really that that can be quite a small niche area and looking for new new compounds is is um, the way to go currently next slide please So really, in summary, um, I hope I've given you a little bit of flavour of some of the research that's going on, not just in Newcastle, but throughout the United Kingdom and, dare I say, internationally. You know, we lead the way in patient care guidelines in the UK, and that's exceptionally important until we find a, an effective treatment and cure. Care is paramount. Increasing aware of mitochondrial disease is always the first thing our patients ask us for. They just say, you know, you know, they'd say, Chris Gorman, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of going in and having to explain what this condition is. We are leading and currently working, particularly the week the Senate, the campaign to raise awareness. It is extremely important and not just around the mitochondrial community or muscle community. It's exceptionally important, a governmental level, as well as the, the general, general citizens and general public. But setting good care is exceptionally important in rare diseases where we don't have the same level of evidence in other conditions because it's smaller numbers, but it doesn't mean that our standards should be any less. And again, here in the United Kingdom, we lead internationally in a lot of those care guidelines. When patients um, sign up to cohorts or sign up to registries, 
participate with MD UK or Lilly Foundation, one of our partner charities or with ourselves. This is what is driving all our research behind the scene. So when you come to clinic and you give us permission to either save that little bit of tissue, like the muscle, or just your clinical information, you might think, it is amazing that that is driving and pioneering our diagnostic techniques. It tells us what the condition looks like. It allows us to identify other particular patients, particularly if you have a very rare form of mitochondrial disease, because if we see it once, it's pattern recognition. We see it once, we'll spot it again, and we then reach out to the international world to try and educate them. That's why we publish. That's why we publish clinical cases so we can say, look at this. Think of mitochondrial disease. And, you know, in the last three years here, we've had uh, well over 200 publications. And that is significant um, because, again, it's what we're trying to do is educate the international research field. With regards to biobanking, that's really exceptional donation of your human tissues, as hopefully I've given you an idea of what we do with those. It helps us push diagnostics. It helps us develop new techniques. Um, but it also makes us think of better ways of making diagnosis using other tissues, as I was saying, be it facial recognition or be using stool as well. And perhaps um, another salient thing is our established links, you know, without our established links to charitable organizations for those supporting us financially for our research, um, but also helping campaigning, um, we wouldn't be able to drive most of this work that we currently do. So we're trying to strengthen links both nationally, internationally, um, particularly among uh, charitable organizations, but also even just within the NHS itself, making those links to better inform uh, our medical community about what muscle disorders are, as well as mitochondrial disease is really paramount and something we're currently leading in our campaign with. And also making sure the patient's voice is heard, not just at a clinical level, but in the development of new treatments and new drugs nationally and internationally. So I'm going to stop there and hopefully that's given you a little bit of a flavour of what the UK landscape on clinical care and research currently looks like. Thank you very much, Professor Gorman. Um, we have a few questions and um, I'm hoping then to bring in Sarah Holmes, who um, has also been doing some, some research in around mitochondrial disease. So um, one of the questions that occurred um, as you were speaking was what, why are there so few um, clinical trials in mitochondrial disease? Can you comment on what are the limiting factors and, um, and is there an upswing here? Will there be more trials and are we looking forward to more treatments for mitochondrial disease? So yes, John, I think it's like any rare condition or disorder. Um, uh, perhaps the um, incentives in the past for companies has not been significant enough, but there's been legislative change, not just within the UK, but particularly in America, uh, where a lot of the drug companies are based, where actually where you get orphan drug designation, which means there's incentives to develop treatment for smaller disease groups. Um, and that definitely has revolutionized the field from 2015. And if I look at myself in 2015, when I first set up our, our clinical trials hub, it was one trial. And Sarah, remember, we, we, uh, it was between ourselves in London with an American uh, group coming in who was sponsor. And now at the minute, perhaps we are constantly getting requests. So whilst I'm saying this live, there's been quite a few completed and there's an exponential rise. And I think the future looks really, really bright for clinical trials and therapies as more and more people become interested. I also think it also is because people are now recognizing that, and, and I alluded to it, mitochondria are essential for all cells. And whilst a little, you know, as I shouldn't call it a little, but a little, you know, when there's spelling mistakes within the gene that cause primary mitochondrial diseases, mitochondria are also, um, when they don't work right, underpinning a lot of more common diseases like dementia, Parkinson's, epilepsy, and cancer. And I think as more and more fields are starting to see that, they're now reaching out to us for our expertise. And I think with that also will come um, more trials and more funding towards uh, mitochondrial disease. Fantastic. Thank you. 
And I also have a question about repurposing of drugs. So um, you talked um, about uh, the drug discovery pathway and, and, and the importance of, of bringing through new drugs. Uh, are there any drugs out there that are used otherwise in neuromuscular diseases or other uh, for other purposes that might be applied in mitochondrial disease? There are, there are some potentially on the high rise. And there's one current trial that we're leading here where we're repurposing a drug um, for mitochondrial disease, um, which is called Asipamox, which was originally used for um, high cholesterol to fats within the blood, uh, has shown some purpose. There's been another trial which has looked at a similar agent that um, looks like it has some effect in muscle. But these currently are uh, only a couple of small studies. And I, I suspect the difficulty is when repurposing, um, John, it's a different funding mechanism. So they take a, whilst you cut the time for development. And, that, and what's really nice about repurposing is if, you know, technically for a drug from the time you screen a compound till it actually gets to the patient on the shelf to be prescribed at least 20 years, repurposing halves it still a considerable period of time and 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 I think if we've learned nothing over the 18 months it's amazing what proper investment can do to expedite that pathway so repurposing is one tool or one mechanism we have but we also need to 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 look at um uh, more investment in 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 drug discovery and the simple compound screening fantastic thank you very much can I invite Sarah um to join us and um uh, hi I, I, an open invitation to um talk about some research that you're doing sure i'll just perhaps quickly just um add to what Bronnie was saying about the limitations with research because i think particularly their research is looking at physical interventions, exercise, for example, one of the huge challenges for mitochondrial disease is that everyone is so different. That variability in presentation, the fact that any system can be affected, means that each, people, each person we see in clinic will be so different and that, that often creates a big challenge for we need to look at the groups to see if interventions work. Um, but I'm, my role is very much clinical, so I'm employed by the NHS in London. I work alongside Natalie, who's also on the panel, but we are involved in research. There's so much more research happening in the, in the time since I started in this role. Um, it's really exciting. And we're involved, myself and colleagues in London, are involved in a study looking at trying to improve the diagnosis of inner ear balance problems in people with mitochondrial disease. That's, that's all from me for that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, alternative um, uh, therapies. Um, I suppose we are um, solidly in the uh, in the territory of, of clinical research here, but um, uh, apart from as part apart from the regular drug um, uh, discovery pathway, are there other um, medicines and um, 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 uh, so I, I'm trying I suppose I'm trying to ask whether there is any any um, uh, use for alternative medicine in um, uh, mitochondrial diseases Would you like me to address that John yes, or yes. Sarah yeah no I, I suppose um, I and Sarah probably May, or, uh, may agree with this, I suppose we always look at things as complementary and alternative and complementary are really, really important because complementary is diet, um, you know, things like low residue diet, exercise, perhaps, you know, meditation, we, we would use those. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're particularly exercise in certain forms of mitochondrial disease. I would say it's the only treatment an effective treatment. Um, and as Sarah is saying that, um, you know, we, it's very individualized, you know, it's just like I would say, you'd never bring anybody into the clinic and prescribe a tablet blindly. You sort of look at their condition. So exercise is definitely one of those complementary treatments that is wholly advocated by us um, and can really have good benefit um, in patients, particularly with muscle predominant form of mitochondrial disease.
And and uh, I'm sure Sarah's noticed this, particularly over the last 18 months with the pandemic, that the impact of sedentary behaviour is, is quite remarkable in patients with muscle conditions. And what we're trying to do, I think that's why we're quite keen, particularly in Newcastle, to get people back face to face to look at that and try and get them back on a regime. You know, if you think about it, majority of our patients were deemed vulnerable or extremely vulnerable and have had to lock down most of the time. One of our biggest things, you know, you know, they may move around the house. It's just not enough. There's not enough movement. And when you don't, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's always what we say to patients and muscle is one of those things. So I think from that perspective, complementary important diet is exceptionally important. That first slide, I always use it. It's the food you take in and your ability to convert it. And sometimes we can manipulate your food so that actually you, when your mitochondria aren't working well to better make use of it. And I also paused quite a bit on your gut because I think loads of us don't think about it. You have to chew the food, swallow it, take all the good bits out and push it out. A lot of patients suffer, I would say, in silence. And we have used alternative things like low residue diet, manipulation of diets um, uh, to try and push, um, uh, literally to help push waste product out because some, you know, in conventional clinic would say to you, do you have a bowel motion every day? Some patients don't have a bowel motion once a week or every two weeks. And we're also trying to make that discussion less taboo. Come into our clinic is probably one of the first things you ask about. So yes, there are complementary medications. A lot of the multivitamins are actually not registered. They're food supplements. So things like Q10 or carnitine, um, each of those have their role. Uh, Q10 in my personal um, practice is I only find effective in patients with muscle symptoms. Uh, L-arginine, I've just completed a review um, that's um, of all the literature pertaining to it. And there's no evidence to suggest that there, it, there is a beneficial effect in it. And we're suggesting more work needs to be done. So in summary, I suppose it's that, you know, what defines complementary and alternative, John, and some of those complementary are exceptionally valuable. And I would say perhaps one of our top um, therapies in the clinic. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have many other questions. Um, I, I, I have one uh, final one of my own. Um, you talked about the cost and length of, of time to bring um, uh, drugs to the market. Um, but you also talked about the diagnostic techniques and um, what our, I guess what our audience probably doesn't realize is the, the effort that is required to validate some of those, those techniques. So can you maybe comment on how long and, and what the challenges are in terms of bringing um, uh, diagnostic techniques for for those other things like blood and urine um, uh, into the clinic? Sure. So, um, uh, yeah, so the years in the making um, and when you think about it, and it's not just about thinking about it, then validating the laboratory. So if I take for I'll, I'll, I'll share our current experience around the new one of the new ones we're working. So you have to apply for funding. There's usually by the time you apply for the funding, it can be a year till you hear if you've been successful and then you secure the funding a year has passed. And then it has to go through several um, processes before you can even start. So you have to collect the samples. You need ethical permission. So it goes to an ethics committee. And now a lot of that's done in parallel because there's regulatory approvals that need to be done. And I'm sure a lot now have heard of the MHRA and R&D. And so all those processes now all run alongside each other. In the past, it was one after each other. But with respects, that's at least nine months process. Um, and so technically, you're nearly two years before you've even collected a sample because it then comes back to whichever hospital you work in and then they need to sign off and they say yes you can do that yes we'll get they will cover the insurance if something happens so you're two years and you haven't even started to validate it in the lab or collect the samples then you may do a pilot first so then that might be, you may say okay it'll take me six months to navigate um, including in a pandemic so you've changed things in the background to to try and reduce um, patients say perhaps coming to clinic and then you collect your sample so you're two and a half years down the process and then you go into the laboratory and even if you put someone on it full time 
in one of our others, you can take a year around the validation. So there you're up to three and a half years, John. And then from then, remember that's only that you go, oh, I think I, I think I've now that I'm happy that that's valid. Then it goes out for peer review to a journal. So your 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 colleagues need to say, yes, that I stand by that looks good. And that in itself can take anywhere between six months and a year. And somewhere in between, you may say to yourself, oh, I should actually put a little pat, I should protect that because it's a UK device thing pending who sponsored you. So you've got legal discussions running along at the same time. So you're four years down the line and then you, someone says, yes, that's it. And then there can be 18 months to two years on top of that. So that's that can be a journey of six years. And someone might go, oh, that's actually quite quick because then it has to go to regular approval among the NHS. So they all your colleagues may say, yes, you've done that correctly. And you might say, OK, I want to introduce that into the NHS under the framework that they would adopt it. And then there's further discussions. So hopefully that's give you a little understanding of that, no matter how quick you might try things. These processes, even on diagnostics, take quite a protected time to bring into real life practice. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So I think I am going to bring the research session to a close. Um, thank you very much, Professor Gorman, uh, for your talk. And thank you for Sarah coming in on, on that. Um, I have just noticed that Rob is back, but I'm not sure. Are you back with us permanently, Rob? I, I hope so. Never work with children, animals or with building work going on downstairs. I think that's <laughs> that's what I'm learning from this session. Thanks. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks, John. And, and thanks to, to Gronia and to Sarah for, for coming in as well. So um, as is the way with these things, often we end up with speakers not being introduced before they come in. So I will now introduce um, Sarah and Natalie um, as we move into the next session uh, this morning, which is looking at um, living with mitochondrial disease. Um, so I'll formally introduce um, uh, Sarah first. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we've obviously sort of heard from you um, already, but Sarah, you're a clinical specialist physiotherapist um, based within the mitochondrial disease and channelopathy clinics at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen's Square in London. She has strong links with therapists working within the trust and with other neuromuscular physiotherapists working in the NHS. And we may touch upon that sort of network um, approach sort of later and the, the importance of sharing best practice. Um, Sarah has extensive NHS experience, including neurological and vestibular rehabilitation. Um, uh, and we're also joined by Natalie James, who's a clinical nurse specialist, also based within the mitochondrial disease and channelopathy clinics at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Um, she's been with the Neuromuscular Service since 2009, initially working with patients with myasthenia and related conditions. Um, she has ex extensive experience of working in neurosciences within the NHS. Um, I was really, before I bring in um, Sarah and Natalie, actually, Gronia, I was very interested in a comment you made about um, how we lead the way in, in, in patient care guidelines. And I, and I imagine that actually the roles that Sarah and Natalie play are quite pivotal in kind of delivering those guidelines. But I wondered if, if you wouldn't mind just saying a few words with your clinical hat on about what those guidelines are before I then sort of bring in Sarah and Natalie. Yeah, sure, Rob. So um, absolutely. So Sarah works um, uh, with our physiotherapist here in, in Newcastle. Uh, particularly around exercise guidance uh, or general physiotherapy, which Sarah's going to um, speak on, which is lovely. And, um, and that's just one aspect. But when I mean care guidelines, uh, we have prescriptive guidelines from everything for um, how you would manage the epilepsy and mitochondrial disease. Um, I think someone's even asked it, how you manage diet. So we have dietary guidelines that are on our website to um, guidelines on, um, uh, you know, uh, seizure management, heart management and surveillance. So every organ that's effectively that we know is commonly affected, hearing screening, we have guidance on um, uh, how often you should be screened for your hearing. As I say, with GI specialist guidelines, um, heart is one in particular that we quite um, adamant to propose because obviously there's really good treatments already that can reverse some of the complications of mitochondrial disease, Rob. Um, but there's a whole, I, I think there's no organ that hasn't been covered um, is available on our website. And there is a general NHS website for mitochondrial conditions and it's got all of those. And we, um, we put it on all our references because we ask clinicians to reach out to it. So it's quite often in the 
those now those guidelines have been adopted internationally um, and uh, European uh, level. We're all meeting again next year to revise some of those guidelines, particularly around muscle, which is interesting in exercise. Um, and at that stage, um, our American colleagues will be brought um, in to join as well, because what we what we've found in the past, Rob, is there is a bit of discrepancy along the guidance. And what we're trying to do is centralize and make sure that, that there's very clear. And as I was saying, because we don't perhaps as much evidence, it's very much around what the clinician, you know, it's a it's a clinical guidance, so it's best practice. Thank you. And are those, are those guidelines, Gordon, are they kind of um, aimed at patients as well, or are they more clinical? Is there, is there a good sort of resource where, where patients could go to to understand the guidelines? Um, yes, so what we're doing at the minute, we work with Lily, particularly in those where we try and convert them. So we're doing a campaign this week, even we've done little, just little, um, little bite size things around. So yes, our guidelines are there, but we are trying to improve the readability of them, Rob, because they are very clinical directed. And dare I say, they're, they're quite long. So what we've already done, is we've done a one page summary because if you're in an acute situation, someone will read them all. Uh, and we are trying to make them more um, patient and user friendly at the moment as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Gonya. Um, Sarah, can I come to you next? We, we've sort of heard a little bit about your research, but very interested in hearing about your role as a, as a physiotherapist and the kind of importance of that for, for people living with the condition and the kind of work you do with patients. I think you've also got a web resource that you're able to, to share with us to help, if that's if that's right. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So my role, as I said, is, is very much clinical. Um, and as for any patients, for seeing a physiotherapist, I'll assess and see where, where the main concerns are and address treatment accordingly. Oh, I think we might have lost, has anyone else lost Sarah? Right, okay. This is, um, oh, she's back, but I will... Um, I can see her coming back on again. But Natalie, do you want to, um, apologies for jumping in there. Um, would you like to just explain your role a bit as the clinical nurse specialist and kind of how, how you support people living with the condition and, and families? And then we'll come back to Sarah, who I can now see has has managed to rejoin. Okay, Natalie... yes. Yeah. No, no worries, no worries. Um, hopefully my um, my speaker's working okay. And um, Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, like Sarah, we work quite closely. I work closely with the other specialist nurses across the three centres. Um, and our roles are largely to support patients with symptom management, information uh, giving, signposting, um, providing education for community teams, um, particularly if you've got somebody who's transitioned from paediatric services. So our, um, our service in London is, is, is different to Newcastle and, and Oxford in that we are an adult only service. Uh, so we get a lot of our youngsters transitioning across from Great Ormond Street. And of course, they then have to navigate the adult setting and learn to connect with all the, the sort of adult services. So, so a lot of that um, comes to me. Um, and Sarah and I will link with local teams, learning disability teams, if they're still at school or college, we'll, we'll link with them. Um, providing information and support for um, young adults who want to go to university, um, getting access to, to grants, housing, those sorts of things. But also on a practical level, how to manage symptoms on a day to day basis encouraging patients to to sort of um, accept that yes they may have the mitochondrial disease but actually that doesn't define who they are um, and to focus on what they are able to do um, and to set sort of practical realistic goals which we link with the physios um, to help them achieve particularly with exercise um, quite a lot of my 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 role Oh, particularly over the last year, and I think this has been echoed by the other the specialist nurses, is psychological support. Um, and we do have access to an amazing um, psychologist um, through uh, within our own services, but also within, within the mitochondrial centres. Um, because I think the pandemic compounded what is quite an anxious you know, experience living with a mitochondrial disease, particularly as it is progressive in a lot of the, the patients. Um, and as Gwanya sort of mentioned, 
they've been shielding, they've been at home, they've been very isolated, they've not been taking part in any group activities. So just trying to sort of encourage people to, to get back out there, get go out for a walk, meet a, meet a friend in a park, those sorts of things. Um, another part of my role is to um, educate nurses. Um, so I do a lot of education of neuroscience nurses within the London area um, to, to sort of highlight that they may see patients with mitochondrial disease on their neurology wards and, and how to best care for them. Um, signposting GPs to care guidelines, writing of emergency plans, managing, managing patients if they do go into hospital and how to how to sort of keep them safe within a district general hospital because quite often patients will report that they have poor experience and that's largely down to lack of understanding of of them and their conditions um and also preventing them from going into hospital that's a huge part of all of our um roles lifestyle management so you know huge impact of diet diet adjustments bowel management it you know patients are always very very wary and embarrassed about talking about diet um, and bowels but actually it's such an important part because if if you're not if your bowels aren't working well you won't feel great and then you're less inclined to to get out there and do stuff um so so that's a huge part of what i do um it's it's very difficult to put a finger exactly you know on it because it, it i cover the whole person um, and it's also for support for family members as well. Mustn't forget those. They're very important. Thanks, Natalie. That's, yeah, yeah, that's really, really helpful over you. I think but, um, it's interesting, both, both you and Gronje have sort of touched on the impact of sort of shielding and, and COVID. So it'd be remiss of me not to sort of plug um, a report that MDUK published um, back in July, which, which looked at the experience of people um, living with muscle wasted conditions as, um, through the sort of COVID pandemic and also on the impact on the services they use and the mental health aspect that you spoke about certainly came through very strongly so we've made some sort of strong recommendations about increasing support for people living with conditions but also upskilling the workforce to help you guys be able to kind of handle um, people's um, deteriorating mental health needs and also um, that point you made Natalie particularly about sort of getting back out and reconnecting um, and I, it, people might also be interested in just jumping on our website to look at our peer support um service where we can connect people to other people living with either either same either the similar condition or actually just who have a have happened to have a muscle wasting condition and are experiencing um a, a challenge with their children or you know, having trouble at work because of their condition so do look at that and also jo maybe look at joining one of our muscle groups which are being held virtually at the moment um because of the pandemic but actually are a great way to kind of still connect with people in, in the same region as you at least which is which is great um sarah i don't know if you're work, i don't know if you're working in the same street as me but um you, you're now back which is good having briefly dropped off so yeah, i am I, back Sorry <laughs> yeah, about I think, that. no worries yes yeah, so if you're going to continue what you were saying about the role of physio but also i think you're about to share some um a web resource with us as well yes so we've got some resources we developed really just to share information with community colleagues um, with people in hospitals, with patients and families. So this is a great resource. It's Mitochondrial NHS is the website. Um, I think we'll share the link later on. Um, but this is, there's some information about mitochondrial disease in general, about the services, so in London, Oxford and Newcastle. And then there's care guidelines. And I'll just direct you to the physio care guidelines. Because actually, some of the images on this really highlight the work that we do, which is so, so varied. It's so individual. Everyone's affected so differently. Um, and actually, just to illustrate that, just go to this image. So mitochondrial disease can affect any one of these areas. So difficulty walking, getting around, balance, posture falls, pain, fatigue. It's different for everyone. And the treatment and approach will, of course, be individualised um, and will support these, these areas, these common reasons why people are referred. So I just wanted to highlight that, that resource. Um, stop sharing the screen. Um, and um, so I think one of the questions, actually the Q&A questions was about crashes, so mito crashes. And as Gronje referred to earlier, fatigue is a huge, huge challenge for people with mitochondrial disease. Um, and it, it feels often like people are running out of energy, running out of juice. Um, the, the crash, I, th I think um, it will 
vary person to person, of course, but sometimes people who have regu regularly experienced fatigue, so that's not tiredness, that's, that's something that stops you functioning, stops you concentrating, stops you being able to move as well, very much unlike tiredness. People who experience fatigue regularly can have what's called a boom bust activity cycle so where on a day often where they're going to hospital or doing a bit more exercise they'll do a lot so that's a boom and then they'll crash so as their energy levels kind of crash and recover and that's that's something we focus on as physios um, sometimes I'll refer to my occupational therapy colleagues um, because actually that that cycle of lots of activity and then an extended period of inactivity to recover is really really unhelpful it means that all the gains you've you've been able to achieve through the exercise are often lost through needing to rest to recover um, there are some resources I'll try and share a link so there's a, a leaflet from UCLH where I'm based that talks about energy conservation and gives a few tips on that um, and there's also an exercise leaflet and I should try and share the link for that that talks about the importance of consistent levels of activity not pushing to the point of exhaustion and that can often be a easier more helpful way of achieving fitness and um, optimizing stamina. Um, the other thing as physios we look at is outcome measures sometimes. So just referring back to the research, we'll, we'll, we'll often be involved in advising or sometimes completing outcome measures for clinical trials. And as in practice, those outcomes have got to be meaningful and sensitive. They've got to detect change in what we want to look at. Um, and they've got to be helpful and, and relevant for the patient, for the research or, or for the physio. The other thing, just touching on the um, isolation and the deconditioning and the impact of of the restrictions we've had over the last couple of years we as physios um and within uclh and i think um oxford and newcastle as well we've been able to uh work with people remotely which in some at some points is a lot better so people are often exhausted traveling half the length of the country to a physio appointment <laughs> So um, it's been great to be able to expand that, that online support. And someone mentioned earlier about some great exercise videos a team at um, neuromuscular team in Coventry have developed. And I think over the, there's been a push and quite a lot of online exercise resources have been delivered and are, are now available. So I think finding something you enjoy and that works for you and that you can do at home can be really, really helpful in, in helping to exercise and helping to optimise fitness, strength, balance, whatever it is. So I can share links for those resources if that's helpful. And we, in my other role in the channel service, we've also developed some Pilates videos um, for a colleague who's a Pilates teacher and a physio. So. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, we'd, 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 we'd really welcome you able to share those resources. That, that'd be great. Um, something something you've said, and, and actually the diagram you, you showed, but also going back to things that Gronje was saying around the the, the, the multiple manifestations, I guess, of mitochondrial disease. In the rare disease framework in the UK, there's a there's a phrase called the the diagnostic odyssey, and I'm I'm guessing that that is very familiar to mitochondrial patients. So so Gronya first, I guess. When when patients come to you first, have they often been diagnosed with other things first, that have then been ruled out before they get to you? And I, presumably that has quite a psychological impact in terms of just the frustration of going round around the system. Um, yeah, the simple answer to that's yes, Rob. Um, I think what's really, uh, again, but, you know, I always try and look at the positive, you know, over the last 10 years, that's changing. What's really nice is that we're starting people reaching out earlier to think of mitochondrial disease. It is absolutely frustrating for patients. You know, it's perhaps the last thing on the list. And I, I suppose that's why, you know, um, we, we keep pushing out even among our, our, you know, our peers is about, you know, why our, you know, why our centre is very interested on making the genetic link to the clinical because it's so varied. Um, I'm a big proponent around pattern recognition. I try to make it easier for the clinician to spot it. So when someone walks in, they think about it. And I think that's what's really great about this week and about even this forum is that we're just, you know, um, you know, our, our, our engagement officer keeps saying to me, Gronje, but, you know, we have to get, you know, beyond practice, you know, preaching to the converted. And, and it's pushing us further and further, engaging with GPs, because really your first point of contact isn't a clinician in a hospital, it's usually your GP. 
Um, it's the nurses in the practice. It's, you know, and we have what's really lovely to start seeing is we've had referrals through from diabetic nurses who have spotted it and went, oh, they're diabetic and a bit of deafness and then said the clinician, have you thought about mitochondria? It's lovely to see that. We have physios now thinking about it, reaching out to thinking, I think I might have someone. What would I advise the clinician? You know, what, how would we refer through? So we're trying to improve um, recognition of conditions and also make the referral pathway easier, Rob, and simple things around little performers that it's a tick box again, because it's only when you, someone less like, oh yeah, that's what might be. So pushing people to reach out to sooner and be more accessible, I think is important. But yes, there is absolutely a diagnostic odyssey. It's different, I'd say, for children. I'd say it's actually still quite complex. And whilst there's still complexity there for adults, I think things are starting to improve. But we've still a way to go. And Natalie, you spoke about um, supporting families as well. I guess is is that part of the the things they're processing? Is it is it? almost a sort of sense of, re of relief when they do get a diagnosis at last or and are people do people come to you with a kind of real almost trauma from the kind of the the, the experience that Gronio sort of talked through yes um certainly um the, with some of the young children who transition through to us because obviously they 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 tend to have much more severe um, multi-system um involvement so we'll we'll often have adults who come to us who have had 20 years of, of, of searching for a diagnosis with, with, with multiple problems. And, you know, it's that, it, it's right. It's that pattern recognition, having somebody sort of think, wait a minute, he's got two or three things wrong, joining the dots and going, could this be a mitochondrial cause? Um, so, so for the adults and for the, for the children, particularly if they're coming through um, who haven't had a diagnosis when we do, do when we do make a diagnosis whether it's through the uh, amazing genetics or biochemistry or, or you know just through a clinical diagnosis that there is a sense of relief but then they go you know so what now how, you know what do we do now can what how can you treat it um how do we manage it and it, you so it answers one question but then opens up a whole load of other questions um, but yes, you know, there is that sense of relief when they do have, a, you know, an answer, but, you know, trying to explain to somebody the complexity of mitochondrial disease is challenging. Thank you. And another part of the role that you mentioned, Natalie, was um, that, that role of sort of signposting people and um, making sure people had the right information. And we had one specific question that came in about where can people get um, information on diet and, and food and which quantities? Where would, where would you normally point them to? And, if, and then I'm very happy for Gronier or Sarah to come in as well, if there's any other um, sort of contributions. Yeah, about. so we, we would link um, in London if our patients are coming to us and we bring them to our um, neuromuscular complex care ward, we would link them in with our dietitian um, and we'd link them with the metabolic dietitians as well who, who can then talk through specifics to that individual because everybody is different. Um, and their needs are different. Uh, so, so having having a really good dietetic in, um, input, we also will link with our neurogastroenterologist as well, particularly if they've got some some bowel symptoms, and then he'll link through to his specific dietitian as well. Um, we don't have a, a mitochondrial dietitian within our service, so we link within the metabolic service. I think other services do have dietitian involvement. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, and I should and another plug from us. We there was a session I think two weeks ago looking at the role of the dietitian more broadly across sort of neuromuscular um, conditions. So um, if people want to jump on the Muscle Matters um, part of our website, that you can find the find the recording there, which which, which may be of use. Um, you've all you've all mentioned the importance of, sort of linking up between the three centres. I feel slightly guilty that we've 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 missed one of them out in the, on the panel, but I'm sure um, you're in alignment with them. But be fascinated to hear a bit more about how the three centres work together. Is it, is it a case of sort of sharing best practice or, um, or is, it, is it more than that? I don't know, Sarah, I'll start, start with you in terms of, is it specifically talking to the other physios in that, in that network? How, what does that look like and what, how does that improve sort of the patient, patient care? So we have a, an annual meeting where everyone attends and that's moved virtually actually, which is a bit easier <laughs> to travel, challenging in some ways, there's lots of us. Um, so we're working collabor collaboratively. Um, I've got a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks actually with Kate and Jane, the physios from um, Oxford and Newcastle respectively, to explore ways of um, 
collaborating, of developing resources. We're, we're the, the only physios in the country that exclusively see patients with mitochondrial disease. So we're, we're in a really important position, really, to be able to take things forward, to improve care, quality, knowledge, resource. Um, so we developed the guidance together and there's at a glance physio guidance on the website as well. And we want to see what, what next stage is. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, yeah, and Natalie, in terms of your, your role, how did you, is, 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 do you have a sort of network of, of clinical nurse specialists as well then that, that you tap into? So, yeah, so so I link with um, the, the nurses in Newcastle. They've got a nurse consultant there, Kath, who's, whose knowledge is, uh, you know, I'd love to download her brain because the information that she has in there is amazing. But also just just, you know, who to go to if there are problems. So if I have a particularly... Um, difficult question that I can't answer I'll send an email out to to the to the other nurses and say listen you know this is this is the situation that I I'm you know I have the question I have has anybody come across have you got any ideas or suggestions on how how we can find a a solution for this patient Um, and and it and it's really good it's a good network um, and we bounce ideas off of each other we eat you know each one of us has our own sort of sub interest within within mitochondrial disease so you know if if somebody's got a particular interest like Kath's really good at at about the bowel side of it so I'll approach her and Alex and say you know what would you do in this situation and and you know they'll come to me if there's there's a question um that, that perhaps I've got an interest in so you know we work quite quite closely that way um more so e- via email rather than video call brilliant thank you and Gronio have you got anything to add in terms of that that, that link up between the three centres um no I, I think you know it's been eloquently covered by Natalie and Sarah I suppose we're commissioned MRO but you know the premise of it is around 2007 governmental funding for the NHS we're all one of three highly specialized services but um what I think is absolutely um superb about all three is is just how much we link to each other and we share good practice and reach out and you know um uh it is very joined up service across uh, across the country um and not only just from the clinical care delivery and devising care guidelines, clinical trials are that way as well. So, you know, um, Rob Paul Keithley, who's released most of the trials in London, him and I will share who is overall lead in those. We work very closely together. Patient groups work really closely together. And as I say, we've really strong links, as you know, to yourselves and to things like Lily Foundation. Um, and actually having those, the network that we have across the country um, makes it very strong internationally. And I think that's why, you know, it, it's not in a boastful way. I say we lead the way in care and lead the way. Um, it's because they look to the three centres um, for guidance. And I'm sure Sarah and Natalie, the same. We get multiple emails every week from outside the United Kingdom looking for help. Um, so I, I think the way the structure of the NHS has brought funding to us, but also how we work collegially across the three centres has, um, has really been um, extremely, I would say, even for myself, as, as we're moving in both the research as well as clinical care, it's been instrumental to the progress that's been made in mitochondrial field in the last decade. Thank you. We've, we had a, another question around um, just exploring a bit more that guidance for sort of general eating and, and healthy balanced diet. Um, Sarah, I think you've mentioned in, in a sort of chat to panellists around the, the, the Eat Well guide, just because just because you're set up as a co-host. Do you want to, do you want to share the yeah. link for that as well? Yeah, so I'm, gonna, I'm that, just, probably a just answering, oh, just uh, typing a reply to one of the emails. So it's Eat Well, you can Google it, but I'll, I'll include the link in the Q&A. That's, thank you. That's, that's great. And we'll definitely sort of send more, more resources. Around. Um, there's, there's still time for people to, to, to add in more questions. At the, mo- I'll, at the moment, this is the concluding question, which I'll send around to everybody. Um, so if I start, I'll, I'll just start in order for people I can see. So, so Gwen, you, you, you mentioned adjustments to the sort of um, the service due to, due to COVID. Just be really interested in, in, in hearing actually kind of what what might be a, what might become a permanent change from the way that you've you, you, you've had to adjust to COVID, and what what have you found has actually worked well? I think we've, we've we've heard from one of you about the sort of reduction in travel time for some appointments and things like that. So just be great to get a reflection on kind of what 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 might continue as a result of having to adjust to COVID, but actually has proved to be a kind of a positive change. 
Um, I, I suppose the one thing is the um, adoption of remote, so video or teleconferencing throughout the whole of the UK. So we already offered those appointments from 2011. Interesting where perhaps in the past we got a bit of pushback all of a sudden, it was acceptable, but what's been really, uh, it will never surpass seeing patients face to face. And I absolutely am a preponderant that when patients need to be seen and we have opened up our clinics, because, but there is an absolutely great role for it because what I can do a bit like yesterday, I can sign into a clinic in Ireland and look at the patient with their specialist and give specialist advice to try and that diagnostic odyssey, reduce the time. I can phone into the Hebrides to a clinic, which I've done. And, and perhaps the clinician, you know, in the past were perhaps trusts outside of bigger centers were a wee bit reluctant to adopt technology or a little bit afraid, obviously because of confidentiality. I would say one of the best things has been the adoption of that technology because it's allowed me to dip in, but it will itch, but equally so, it should never, it should never replace face-to-face -face consultations. So I see it as an add-on where I can phone in, or if I've seen a patient in clinic, what I really like to do is I'll phone back in 12 weeks time, particularly first appointments, because I say to them it's information overload. It's a really nice way that they don't have to travel across the country where I can reach out to them and say, um, you know, how did that go? What are the questions you have? So that they're not waiting for six months or a year to come back to you and storing up all the questions. So as a quick response, I think that's a really good initiative around its adoption but I would be cautious that it doesn't replace face-to-face -face full time. Well, yeah, we, we did have, and I think in the first month of the pandemic, we did hear from someone who'd received a letter inviting them to receive their MRI scan by phone, which we thought was probably <laughs> un, 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 unlikely to be an innovation. We're not there yet, yet Rob. Its way in, yeah. <laughs> not there um, yet. Yeah, Sarah, same question to you, really. I mean, I think, I think you mentioned um, you're being able to see patients virtually, but any other kind of um, in, innovations you, you were forced into by COVID actually you might, you might hold on to, do you think? Um, well, I think that I've been really surprised. A couple of years ago, I really never thought that I'd be able to do anything as a physio. My, you know, my these my hands are my my job really. But I've been really surprised how much we've been able to achieve working dynamically and creatively. It's not right for everyone, and it's not right for all situations at all. We need that face to face. But even if um, a follow up by phone or video can be an option, I think that's that's been really helpful, and lots of people have found that that um that helpful when there's long journeys to travel um i've also linked in with community teams so done a three-way call which has been really good really good so all three of us myself and the local physio and the patient can all meet virtually sometimes with the physio in the room which has been really good and um for the other part of my job the channelopathy side we're looking at um online pilates groups so maybe um, developing something like that for my two moving forward but I think there's opportunities. Brilliant thanks so and yeah Natalie same, same question to you. Um, well I don't think anything has changed for me that much because most of my um, follow-up was done through telephone anyway um, and the hearing impaired patients we would do uh, you know they'd contact me via email um, I have offered video calls, but I think the, the vast majority of the, the patients that I have contact with are less tech savvy um, and don't have access to the technology. So they prefer to just do telephone follow up. So, you know, for me, it hasn't been as much of a change as it has been for Sarah and, and, and the team. Thank you. I mean, interesting, we've had a comment from, from someone who's um, obviously being seen at Oxford, who's, who's talked about um, a, a virtual sort of patient focus group, which meets regularly, which I think is, it sounds fairly similar to kind of the, the muscle groups I was talking about, about earlier as well. So that, that's certainly sort of a great, great thing to happen. Um, pre predictably, saying we were on to the final question has spurred people to put forward some, some more questions. Um, and I can see Sarah's answering one already, but we've, we, we have talked about mito crashes and, and fatigue, but just really interesting kind of, is, is there any research into the biochemistry of those and, and also um, what happens during sleep that causes a crash? So I don't know who, if anyone's well, happy to take those. <laughs> shall, I, shall I start? I'm not sure how much I can mention that because I think as with mitochondrial disease, it's so variable. A crash to one person will be very different to a crash to another. And I think, well, I, think I don't know if you'd agree, Gronia, but I'd want to know a little bit more about 
an individual's experience of fatigue, what their exercise levels are, probably see some bloods to try and understand and unpick what was happening. Um, I, I don't think there's a simple answer that addresses that concern for all, because it will really vary. Um, so, yeah, sometimes, if, if, as I said earlier, sometimes if somebody has um, significant barriers and challenges with fatigue, their the body reacts. And this is the case for lots and lots of conditions. So people with MS, stroke, Parkinson's all experience similar boom bust cycles. So that that might be one. I'm I'm not aware of uh, any detail on biochemical changes um, causing that boom bust. Um, but Gronje, would you would you add anything to that, that uh, question? I at all? Yeah, I'd agree with you, Sarah. It's always a very personalised discussion, and what you try and do is deep dive on that the individual. But as a general statement, because uh, I see Tim's put it through, I always go back and um, always think and remind everybody: um, fasting is not good for anybody with mitochondrial disease. And our longest period of fast, with even clinicians, we all forget, is when you sleep. Is, um, and if you've had a really busy day and you tweet for 12 hours, there may have been a short window of time. So I always think, go back and look at their diet for the day. What have they eaten? Had they prepped themselves before they went to bed? Maybe they should have a snack where you and I mightn't. And so it's literally deep diving because if you've expended the energy, then you could be going and running deplete going into your sleep. And technically, we all hibernate at night but we don't totally shut down. A lot of things do occur physiologically. So if someone's finding that um, and also if they're diabetic, there's little things we would do to adjust. So the thing I would add um, to that, Sarah, yes, is maybe just deep dive on what they've eaten during the day, making sure there's no prolonged fasting and reminding them, you know, your, your longest fast is actually during your sleep. Um, and just to add, I suppose it's just referring back to and complimenting what Ronya said and referring back to what I mentioned earlier, it's thinking about how hard the exercise is. So there's a scale called the rates of perceived exertion that you can Google, the Borg scale that talks about the intensity that you work to when you're exercising, the level of exertion. And we generally recommend that people work to a three or a five on that scale. And you know that you've reached that level because you might feel a bit warmer, you might start to perspire slightly, but you'll be comfortably able to talk in a full sentence. And I'd suggest if you're consistently working to that level, but not past it, so not to the point where you're gasping and ready to collapse, that might be a, a more successful model where you're able to exercise to a moderate level and keep that consistency going to avoid those crashes. So hopefully that Borg or RPE scale might be a helpful resource. Hope that helps. Thank you, Sarah. That's really helpful. Um, that that brings us actually to the conclusion. We've we've sort of gone through our questions. It's been a fascinating session. I'd really really like to thank sort of Gronje, Sarah, and Natalie. Your contributions have been have been fantastic, and thank you for um, bearing with us on the various technical small technical issues that we experienced. So thank you very much. Um, a huge thanks as well to those of you who, who've joined us, um, both just as audience members, but also for for submitting questions. That's been a great help to the session. And thanks finally to our to our sponsors again, PTC Therapeutics and, and Roche. Um, There'll be um, the recording of this session will be available online over the next couple of days. Um, and do please get in touch with us at info at musculardystrophyuk.org um, if you'd like to follow up any of the questions that will be put forward or, or you've had any thoughts after the session and we'll do our best to um, answer them and, and, potent and potentially email Bronya, Sarah and Natalie to help us if there's any specific questions that, that come through. So a huge thank you to everybody and um, I'll say goodbye and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.